I have already, uh, I have already told that you can. I mean, we can start now. Your voice is not coming actually. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Start now. You can start now. Namaskar. Good afternoon. Okay. Namaskar. 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 Uh -huh. Yes. Shreyas, are you starting today? Uh, I am just going to recapitulate what happened yesterday, and I think then Soma sister will moderate the whole session. Okay. Hmm. So. Uh, okay, just wait. Okay, should I start? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, respected guest panelist, dignitaries, and uh, all participants, this is the second day of our three-day online training program on resilience measure of buildings with special reference to floods and cyclones, which is organized by National Institute of Disaster Management in collaboration with University of Pardavan, Department of Geography. So I'm just going to give you a brief that what happened yesterday and uh, from where we are going to start today. So yesterday the session was, the inaugural session was moderated by Professor N.C. Janasar. He is also the convener of this program. And after that, a special address was delivered by Professor Nimai Chandra Saha. He is vice chancellor of the University of Pardavan. And then uh, the HOT, head of department, Department of Geography, he gave his introductory remarks. And after that, uh, the pro VC, pro VC of the University of Pardavan, Professor Asis Kumar Panigrahi, sir. Uh, he shared his welcome address. He talked about prevention, preparation, and mitigation for loss of lives and livelihood, government approach for disaster institutionalization, and legislation of disaster management, DRR, uh, as an urgent need of our. After that, uh, uh, head of Resilient Infrastructure Division, NIDM, Professor Chandan Ghosh, he delivered his keynote address, and he uh, shared his... Uh, he shared his view on the uh, cost-effective uh, geomembrane solution for storing the water during the flood situation. And he also talked about flood and cyclone intensity and impact in reference to West Bengal. Uh, after that, Dr. Garima Agrawal, she is senior consultant in Resilient Infrastructure Division NIDM. She set the context of this webinar, uh, sorry, online training program. And she, uh, she shared the structure of the course and also discussed about the damage of infrastructure, ecosystem and livelihood due to the flood and cyclones. She gave her details uh, about some previous cyclones such as Amphan and Yas and how we can uh, uh, prepare and uh, make an action plan for disaster risk reduction. After this inaugural session, we went to the our technical session and first session was on the topic of understanding the hazard, vulnerability and risk and these terminologies, basic terminologies of disaster management. And this session was taken by Professor Poonam Sarma. She is Director, Center for Disaster Management Studies, Sahid Bhagat Singh College, University of Delhi. She talked about the temporal increase in hazards, mainly in flood and cyclone and its impact. Special distribution and decadial average of different disasters, definition of major terms, hazard, risk, vulnerability, etc., and their interrelationship. After that, the second session was on reviewing the situation of floods and tropical cyclones in West Bengal, and it was taken by Professor N.C. Jana. Uh, uh, as I uh, said previously, he is convener and he is also the professor in Department of Geography, the University of Pardavan. He discussed about the river of Bhagirathi Hugli Basin, uh, how he generate flood because of high rainfall and limited carrying capacity of the river. He also discussed about the eight teams from National Disaster Response, uh, NDRF, and uh, how they provided assistance to the state authorities in the rehabilitation and evacuation of the flood affected uh, peoples. Uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, he has also discussed a uh, few topics uh, like flood and cyclone hazard profile of West Bengal, aerial distribution and contributing factors. In the last, the last session was on synthesis of multi-archive data set and multiple approaches for flood hazard assessment. And it was taken by Dr. Sujaya Bandhu 
he is assistant professor in geography kazi narula university asansol west bengal he discussed that a uh, great loss of life and property during 1864 storms in kolkata and he demonstrated that and the sketch of the tornado uh, uh, which crosses the railway track in uh, pandua he also uh, shared few ppts about that he also shared some archive uh, how we can uh, how we can track the flood uh, related activities in the historical uh, uh, archives how they are uh, uh, documented there so this was the whole uh, uh, summary of yesterday's session and today we are going to uh, uh, we are going to learn uh, through the three lectures in the today we have three sessions and the first will be on the flood and cyclone resistance infrastructural methods and techniques it will going to be taken by professor chandan ghosh head resilient infrastructure division and idm the second session will be on forecasting cyclone and disaster management uh, it is uh, going to be taken by dr sanjeev bandobadhyay De uh, deputy director general imd regional meteorological center kolkata and the last session will be on the role of local governments and ngos in disaster preparedness and management and professor lakshmi narayan satpati will take this he is director ugc hrdc university of calcutta so participants uh, this is uh, a summary of yesterday's and what we are going to do today uh, thank you very much from my side i am uh, uh, over to you dr somasis i think he is going to moderate today's session and uh, from my side welcome to all the respected dignitaries thank you very much thank you sir Good afternoon to the respected dignitaries and um, dear participants. So we are in the second day of this uh, program, which is organized by National Disaster <coughs> National Institute of Disaster Management in collaboration with the Department of Geography, the University of Burdwan. On today we have three lectures the, uh, by distinguished speakers. Who are uh, Professor Chandan Ghosh, Head, Resilient Infrastructure Division, NIDM, Ministry of Home Affairs, uh, Government of India. We will be speaking on flood and cyclone resistance, infrastructural methods and techniques. The second lecture will be uh, delivered by Dr. Shunji Bandopadhyay, Deputy Director General, uh, IMD, Regional Meteorological Center, Kolkata. He will be speaking on forecasting cyclones and disaster management. And the third lecture of today is will be delivered by professor lakshmi narayan satpati he is the director ugc ugc hrdc university of calcutta uh -huh. he will be speaking on the role of local government uh, role of local governments and uh, ngos in disaster preparedness and management i will be so uh, uh, right now i will request professor chandun ghosh to uh, enlighten us on the topic of flood and cyclone resistance infrastructural methods and techniques. So before that, I will take a few minutes to introduce uh, Professor Ghosh. So Professor Chandun Ghosh is a civil engineering graduate in the year 1985. I think it was told already yesterday. Uh -huh. <laughs> Minimize it. So, okay, sir, you can start then. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Share button, please. Thank you uh, for this uh, organization of this uh, this uh, online seminar, which is as lively as if that we are meeting each other and so vivid communication and very, very present uh, planning as well as uh, lecture that uh, being arranged by NIDM and Bardhavan University team. Uh, thank you, Stresh, and also Professor Jana. Yes, you are always uh, as a as a guidance that your guidance and your team have been working. And uh, so, uh, of course, I take a little bit of freedom to speak in every seminar that we arrange, whatever way that it is possible. Uh, whenever the word comes, resilience measures, then yes, uh, we look forward to see that what measures should be taken at place. Despite having, we have a uh, lot of system in place. Uh, so making up several commissions and there are so many uh, 
so many uh, committees have been formed since 1950s onward till date but flood throughout the globe is taking toll and it is making us the, the making us really uh, perturbed and with the life loss and most importantly the damage losses so there are a lot of reports are available but i would like to go directly to the resilience measures in fact it is a continuation to whatever few slides that i have shown yesterday during keynote uh, speech or welcome speech whatever so i share my slide here okay Okay, it is seen. Yes. Yeah, it is visible. Visible. Okay. okay. So I first start with uh, uh, with the situation like this we face wherever we are living, whether it is in Bardhavan or in Calcutta or in Delhi. Uh, whenever there is a fresh rainfall, and we still lagging behind in correctly estimating the uh, inundation scenario locally inundation scenario locally at our own locality or in our own area or in the village or wherever we are living so whenever flood water is coming we uh, are not much uh, familiar as well as uh, made specific kind of you know warning that at what time and what minute of the day or hour that water is going to come and to what level and how long it is going to be inundated in our local area so just uh, to take a scenario taken here scenario means it is a live photograph taken from some sources uh, that a eight-story building is having a special boundary wall here why i say special because this is a boundary wall and they they Whenever water is coming, flood water or rain water or from some other, or even dam, dam related uh, damages uh, de like in Kerala or many other uh, countries in the world, that when synchronization in the uh, water release is not done properly and which has taken again a, a big route into our understanding about the reservoir management, even though a lot of projects and a lot of uh, grants, a lot of, uh, you say, foreign aids are also coming in. I'm not telling about the particular cases, uh, but dam related, dam which are in the civilization that started and dam we have, and right now in the modern temple, which uh, Pandit Jalla Nehru as a prime minister while opening uh, Varkanangal Dam, he said in 1954 or 5 that these are the modern temple of uh, say our progress or civilization but those are we are not able to manage it and little bit of that i have uh, told uh, in the yesterday but now taking up in our code in our area we cannot shift a eight story building as such a thing or important building we cannot shift it just because water is coming for few hours or few days then what can what kind of local resilient measures to be taken? What kind of local resilient measures to be taken? Photo itself is a, giving a proof that only at the cost of a not at the cost, rather making this boundary wall painted with some kind of several kinds of paints and adhesives are available. Uh, so what measures is taken? It is only these adhesives or paints are being painted as we know that the such things or we have been told that it is better to protect this building or stopping the operation it is rather taking care of the wall uh, here so that minimum leakage or minimum water pass through that even if it is coming there could be some arrangement for such kind of arrangement like this is done in our campus previous campus previous previous campus where we stayed for more than uh, say 12, 13 years, or 12, 13 years we stayed there. 
So uh, in that, uh, there used to be a flood in the first week of July in our campus. And it used to be needed water here. So uh, here in the campus itself, there are some measurement has some measures have been taken to to make because it is just like a bowl kind of things. So whatever rain that happening locally, majority of the water that which is coming, it is from outside. But as you know, we are familiar with the roads are becoming uh, higher and higher with the existing building that they are in the lower position. But you know that now, uh, whatever this statement was made, this statement now is being taken off because whenever we are making road these days, every year it used to get one inch or something higher. Instead of that, now we have got scratching machine now. There are, there are heavy duty machines are there, which will scratch out the pavements, which got deteriorated. And then so that road level doesn't go up. If it is required, then only otherwise, when roads are constructed, road level should remain same until and unless some other reasons are there to make it higher and higher. Because we didn't have that uh, peeling of equipment a few years back. So right now, most of the important roads that uh, in our cities or metro cities or highways, we do not raise the road level because of that uh, problem that happens during flood or surrounding buildings. It is rather take out the uh, deteriorated or uh, those uh, payment uh, that got bad, take it and then place it again. And now these days machines are available uh, that wherever some pits or some kind of depression has occurred on the road, and uh, within a few minutes, just mix, which is same bitumen and some other things. So, you know, we have seen many of the videos, even in YouTube videos are available. Instantly, they mix uh, a special kind of bitumen and some adhesives and make it corrected on in situ itself. So that kind of potholes treatment, substication also has come. But here that what is taken up compared to this one, there must be some leakage here, but we can arrange for some kind of you know, pump, like which is arranged over here. Entire campus, is, which is about seven acre. So it is having the drain, but drains are lower than the surrounding area, outside the boundary area. So uh, after two, three, few years of such kind of problems and needed water, we have arranged a dedicated uh, pump to pump out the water, which is stored over here. On the other side, uh, at a distance, because you know these kind of pumps, we all know they can. They are so heavy duty pumps are available uh, that uh, they are being arranged so that the water that which is uh, taken out, it is placed on an area that where it will not come back to the position. So this is a common sense that we are applying rather than taking some traditional heavy duty or heavy costly measures, but some kind of stopgap measures, immediate measures like this one or this one can make really uh, some of the substantial uh, so changes in our way of resiliency to our area that where we are living and tax to it. So today's contact is, uh, context is no need to highlight much because there are a lot of literatures are coming up and they are available and giving uh, details of what has been happening traditionally for a decade ago, two decades ago. There are lots of reports are there. And, especially in the last two decades that we have added another dimension to the flood, the urban flood or flash flood, something like that. So management and attitude issues are many. So which I'll highlight some of them and how to solve them, how to, how to root out the problem at its source. Damage and loss are colossal, of course, and Flood protection measures. Here we have to see that vulnerability index uh, have been made for all kinds of hazards in our country, published by Ministry of Home Affairs. I'll show some of the slides from there. And then flood protection measures. Whatever measures have been taken up, like, like uh, dam, making dam or Damodar Valley Corporation, that this uh, making dam means Damodar was the sorrow of Bengal. And, and in order to turn the sorrow to the happiness, it was done in 19. 47, 48, uh, that this uh, came up before. Uh, and then it is taken up, I think 1943 or something, you know. Uh, and then four dams have been created. So sorrow has been turned to a happiness. But now we are seeing that because of the long uh, overdue maintenance issues that they are causing now trouble because their storage capacity silting and 
and the irrigation area has been uh, dwindled uh, because we have not taken that flood protection measures are there and uh, but management and attitude issues are many these are nothing but management and attitude issues but we would like to see that making dam is not feasible as i have discussed yesterday also but there are some natural way which we will see uh, how we can take some kind of soft measures including hard measures that we can make an uh, make an equivalent flood uh, say resilient measures uh, which can be done using some natural way also and storage of surplus water not yet attended to rationally but it is affordable so i'll show stories of uh, this water extra water which are costly which are uh, some of the things are very much affordable only thing is that uh, it is to be shown or it is to be taken into account that what are those not so costly but affordable way so affordable part i would like to show with the prices and how it can be made uh, possible by each and every one every household uh, living in the colony or in the city or even in the university campus. And then flood walls for protections and flexible storage system using geosynthetics, which is a new wonder material for the last four decades that the country is producing and majority of the more than 90% of them we are exporting because we are not still uh, four decades that we are exporting it, but still we have not found much uses in our country because we uh, have become some, somehow uh, immune or blind or somehow insensitive uh, the kind of uh, wonders that this material is doing. Then I'll show just one, two, uh, if time permits, so that one of the way that using natural way is something that uh, that natural way means bioengineering is one of that, but I'll not go into the bioengineering application part I'll show a few, but not into the science and technology behind that, but only thing that how it is uh, working by observing it and no amount of, you know, data uh, that or their interrelation with the erosion control, sealed, how they are growing and how nature's wonder is uh, is abundantly available in our country, but we are somehow insensitive towards such kind of measures. So I'll show some of these examples. So first thing I wanted to show that rainwater harvesting, how many of we have written or heard many such discourse or lectures that in our colonies or in our area, oh, rainwater harvesting means there should be a safety tank type of structure should be there below the ground. And then we take enough measures to bring the roof water only into this. But you see, in order to make a safety tank type of things or a big water tank below and along with the filter that we are using, it takes, it is a heavy amount that, uh, that is why government gave some subsidy. And there are some uh, traditional way of making those kind of uh, pit in the locality or colony. But of course, West Bengal, uh, Calcutta area and all this area, you are having enough rainfall so you don't need. But at the same time, when it is not raining, then proper management of water, supply water, or even irrigation water, uh, there are water distress surges. This is again a management issue, attitude issue. But keeping a such kind of things, a foldable things, keep it foldable for 10 years, nothing will happen to such kind of things. And store water in such kind of flexible thing wherever you want. And the cost wise, you see, uh, if you want to store this much of water using traditional way, it will cost at least 100 times more than what we are supposed to spend getting these things, tailored made this thing, customized this thing. And it is so handy. And put all these devices which any household like us, we can make it and use them as appropriately as possible. And this is, of course, uh, uh, while making such kind of arrangement, which everybody knows, every contractor or householder, they know that how to store this water. But uh, making this arrangement is very much affordable. That is what cheap, huh? I say storage, flexible storage. Anywhere we can store them. For that, we don't have to put them in a very confined box with a 10 inch uh, brick wall and something giving a cover and other things. This is one aspect. 
And when we go the sophisticated one, you see that many cities, this is a uh, photograph, in fact, uh, abstract photograph, but it is highlighted in Japan, Tokyo, especially, you see uh, that how they store the water by putting a porous pavement, porous pavement, because water will not come here, but these pavements are porous. And in our country also, some of the road sections, we have made our pavement porous, uh, porous enough. Whatever amount of rainfall is happening, what happened in most of the accident happens during rainfall in our country or in many of the other countries. Why it happens? Because we do not have the porous concrete or porous street or porous pavement. Because water is there, so it becomes slippery and uh, many of the accidents happen. There are reports are there, you can see. But there are technologies and know-how which are perfected more than two decades ago that allowing whatever may be the rainfall is happening over here. So they will be immediately soaked into the pavement and there will be certain arrangement to collect them on the sideways. So same arrangement made over here and several projects have been done in our country also taking this technology and know-how from Japan and many other countries are doing where, you know, in Japan also, the, it is all surrounded by sea. So they have to store this rainwater for their drinking purpose. So this is the arrangement which is sophisticated one, costly one, but at the same time, uh, rather than converting seawater into the sweet water, getting this kind of mineral resource and natural water and storing them, whatever infrastructure is required, that is that needs a sophisticated one and technology is very much enriched in this area. So uh, now let me go back just to show that uh, the disaster resiliency index, it is in fact taken from uh, this report, which is published by NDMI India, NDM India, and you can see this report that uh, PDF is in, you can download it. You can see there's some disaster resiliency index uh, based on like 14 disaster here that they have added. And in that, uh, you can see cyclone, flood, drought, and all these things. And uh, so you can see some of this that done for our own country. At the same time, drought and flood, you see, uh, when there is a flood, then the question of drought is also there, which is a very contrasting thing that we have to face. And for that matter, uh, uh, into the, uh, about two decades back, interlinking of the river uh, was in, uh, put forward the idea, but it came into some of the political as well as regional biases and controversy. And it was not able to be a feasible one because of the many of the environmental problems and other things. But now with the current day's technology, you may know that uh, whatever, like our country is on an average, say, uh, the Himalayan river, which are having water surplus. And in, uh, in the middle side, uh, like it is a distance of about say thousand kilometer or in Karnataka, where North Karnataka, we know that many people are, uh, many of the farmers, they have to go take their own life because of the drought. But in the South Karnataka, which is hardly 200 or 300 kilometer away, which is a water surplus, more than 2,500 uh, millimeter rainfall occurs. And it is, it happens uh, almost uh, twice in a year. And that surplus water, which is in a little lower side, 200 kilometer taking that extra water. So we cannot have a normal canal system taking a lower, taking the uh, water from the lower side, which is South Karnataka, for example, and taking it to the Northern part where drought is very much uh, high. So when it is a matter of 200 or 300 kilometer distance, we have got the capacity rather than making a gravity, a gravity flow in a open channel or canal, we can pump this water to any height or any distance. And in order to make a say 200 kilometer of pipeline, which will carry like equivalent of Taligan's Nala, equivalent of that water, whatever uh, sewerages that it is carrying or whatever canals that it carries, say 20 meter or 30 meter, most of the time say 10 meter on an average width and one meter or 1.5 meter height. Uh, which goes in a gravity flow, maybe one meter per second maximum. Whereas with the pump system, it can be converted or it can be sent to the same place 
200 kilometer, 300 kilometer with a systematic arrangement of this pump, it can be it can be sand and there are this geomembrane or geosynthetic pipes, flexible pipes are available. Available for that we don't have to take any of the uh, farmers' land and making this pipeline, laying this pipeline, say for 200 kilometer, we have got the organization and capacity and infrastructure company. It will not take more than a day to more than a day. It will not take more than a day to lay a pipeline of say two meter diameter, uh, which is equivalent to 10 meter canal and sending water with a heavy duty pump, sending the water from one place to another place without disturbing the environment, either overground or underground, with support or without support. And in a day or maximum in a week time, 200 kilometer pipeline can be made by the by the uh, agencies that we have and materials that we are having planted in our country. So in that case, the, the, uh, this, uh, the, this drought and flood management that traditionally that we have been looking into, uh, that interlinking of the rivers, now it is being done artificially in this manner, not severing the environment, but rather making this pipeline uh, that and using a heavy duty pump and taking water, whatever distance that we want. So when 100 kilometer pipeline can be made in a day or two, how does it matter that we can invest uh, some money which is not substantial enough? Rather, it will help in mitigating and dichotomy of you know river linking and making a big dam and other things. So we are having surplus river water. We are having again drought-prone area where rivers are dry. So that is why the, the great projects that are taken up in Andhra Pradesh and Godavari and Krishna link. It is being done. Uh, of course, dam was uh, construction got halted, but extra water which is crossing or passing through Godavari uh, River is being passed and now diverted into the Krishna River. And that water is also taken to the many of the metro cities. So again, uh, social uh, relative weights on hazards. Well, that is, there are many such reports are there, but you can see that uh, drought and flood, especially social infrastructure, weight is five. This is as per the index report that uh, alert index report that collected from the NDM uh, MHA website. You can see through that, and it will give you uh, a, a fair estimate of that. What are the uh, vulnerable area that in our country in case of flood or there are 14 kind of uh, 14 15 kind of uh, this event or uh, hazard that has been taken up but mind it it is a hazard base though it is called vulnerability but uh, it is there is a lot a lot of dichotomy between the defining hazard and vulnerability and then risk and every people they have their own way of definition but we as a civil engineer we understand that it is not so easy just to uh, upgrade the hazard indexing zone or hazard based on the hazard index that uh, turning into vulnerability. There are there are several factors that depends on that uh, while uh, taking into this account. Simply uh, putting some weightage or uh, 0.1, 0.2 and something is not going to help in that matter. So flood management can be defined as a sum of activities or as overall processes involved in mitigating the extent of flooding and in impact or impact of flooding before, during, and after the flood event. So some of the things uh, that we have to look at, we have to adapt, cope, and we have to prevent, we have to mitigate, we have to operate. So there are many such what micrographs are available. Uh, now let me go into micro level how to stop water entering into our courtyard. So there are several such examples are there. And these are all, you see that by putting some kind of flood sucks, uh, which is again a byproduct of uh, our crude oil, petroleum or geosynthetics, uh, which uh, when it comes in contact with water, then it gets flow, it gets like this. Like you see uh, that it, it is something like a paper kind of things, textile kind of things like this is something like this uh, that which are having certain uh, polymeric material and when it comes in contact with water 
then it becomes just like a sandbag or whatever it is. When they are placed one above the other, then the interface becomes sealed and it doesn't leak any water. So in that case, here you see such kind of things can be arranged uh, uh, to stop water. Otherwise, if this water is not stopped over here, it will go into this area and would, it would play a havoc, damaging many properties and other things. Or even you can see that uh, how they are, even in our indoors, uh, that how they are taken care of. Like stopping water, even in the bathrooms also, that even on the road to divert the water, you see how these bags are being used. So there are many ways, you see, that these are the application that uh, using this kind of sandbag, which is popularly known to us. Uh, we are all having uh, this kind of filter in our house most of the time because we don't have the system that's supplying water directly to our uh, drinking uh, tap in our old houses, even though knowledge all uh, and many programs are going on, but still, uh, and many of the villages are getting now 24-7 water and there are, there are long promises are there, but still maintaining the purity of the water uh, still it is it, uh, very difficult. So in that case, just let me have some kind of things. When such kind of things we spend 10,000 or 15,000, depending on the quality that, or upgradation that uh, which is taking place, we use uh, one filter. One is carbon filter, another is this kind of filter. You all may be familiar with. Uh, this is that filter, which is costing about maybe uh, 300 to 400 uh, rupees, which is used uh, in parallel to the uh, carbon filter that uh, in our EquaGuard or many of these kind of system, now more than 20 plus companies are there. But at the same time, when you see, this is nothing but the geotextile that I have shown over here. This is nothing but this kind of geotextile. And what is the cost of this geotextile? And how much we pay? Uh, if we do home application of geosynthetics, uh, this is what is being applied into the filter uh, here, applied over here. So this filter cost, I'll show you, it is not even a one rupee. Huh? It is not even a one rupee is the cost of this fil filter. But when it comes as a prepared product into our own household, it becomes 400 rupees, which is quite justified because it needs lots of you know, uh, making this, uh, making this, and all these things. But one rupee we can use in our house, household, not replacing these things. But we know that raw material is plenty available in our country. So uh, when raw material is available, then we have to find out some of the, uh, you know, simple way, natural way, uh, to stop dirty particles at least entering into our water tank or in the tape using this geotextile material. Because on an otherwise, cost as on date is about for thousand liter, uh, or we put so much of money for thousand liter. See, these are the 24 rupees per square meter is this kind of geotextile, which is used over here. Or there are several varieties, are there. these are the geotextile. This is 70 rupees per square meter. Of course, this is not the use. I just wanted to highlight this kind of geotextile is 24 rupees per square meter. So you can calculate that if it is the, uh, say, 6 centimeter diameter. So 6 centimeter diameter, and if you take 1 square meter, 24 rupees, and uh, if you see that circumferential area of this, it's hardly 1 rupee or 2 rupee that it comes as a, as a raw material cost. But at the same time, we can find multiple ways to use that in our household. This I have shown the advantage of flexi membrane for storing water. We can simple in installation, mobile and foldable like this, mobile and foldable, completely stable system, flat and level ground is the only requirement. Then uh, no earthwork, no projects or licenses are required to use this. Eliminates evaporation, avoiding algae and insect emergence, no oxidation, free from any external pollution. So there are many things are and designed to last for over 25 years. And 10 years warranty on material. 
100% recyclable. And it is also minus 32 plus 60 degrees. These are all tested. High mechanical resistance and wide range of temperature, minus 32 plus 60 degrees, which you know, almost all our habitat uh, area, except the Ladakh or Leh Ladakh, where our armies are guarding our uh, border area. Other than that, uh, majority, 99.99% uh, area, that it is not beyond 50 degree and not below 15 degree, whatever it is. So in that range, you see that these are the material that which are available and which can be customized and taken to any height, like first photograph, a few photo, uh, photograph that I have shown. And also they are available in this manner. So you see, I have taken the screenshot, whatever the price is written, the rupees is there. So you can choose thousands of varieties of this material uh, that are available in the market. Our way that uh, is to understand their property and which can be whoever is the manufacturer is there, they will be giving you a certificate and, and then all the specification and there are testing laboratories available, available. Geosynthetics or polymer testing laboratories are available. And when they are available, you can check for a customized application in any area in the city or in the river, wherever we want. These are the uh, organization, uh, these are the specific material that are available for the purpose. Now, uh, of course, we, we are fed up with such kind of failure uh, when the rainwater comes and uh, even though it was designed by engineer, but it has failed. It is because that uh, whatever scouring was taking place, then when we visit such kind of site, then we see that what were the progressive failure that has been caused every season whenever it is raining. So one of the important aspects is that before failing anything, it gives certain kind of symptoms. So our resilience measures or preparedness measures, especially in flood or cyclone, we have to see that whatever infrastructure in the form of like here, it is a bridge, it is in Jharkhand, uh, that when bridge failure occurs, before that it gives certain kind of symptoms. And in that case, experts have to go there, check that is there scouring taking place or if it is raining so much that if water is gusting uh, over this then what kind of cavities that it is forming so these are part and parcel of our uh, you know engineering department that especially roads and bridges that they have to look at that uh, while during the maintenance and is there any such thing going to happen or not so we have to be uh, not simply a careful enough but we have to give our own effort uh, and our awareness uh, about uh, such kind of vulnerability that which is defined over here. Not by simply putting some numbers or marks and some kind of weightage and decorate some kind of table that these are the vulnerable indexes. And what we do, what how to cook those indexes, those numbers and figures, until and unless we see such kind of failures uh, with the, uh, and then why it has caused and how it could have been prevented. That is the basic thing that you have to look at. When some failure occurs like this, just I wanted to show that some failure, it is a stock photo by Elami, uh, that when such failure occur, like here, it happened in June last year, just about a year back. Hardly any of the department or responsible person or who have designed or contractor will be put to jail or put to bar or some enforcement directed. Nobody is going to take any inquiry on that. And because this is a system we have made, but when it is under guarantee, like in house or buildings that we make or contractor that make, or even many of the government houses that we make, guarantee part, warranty part is kept under cover or in the report because none of us, we are uh, ensured, we can ensure that about the quality construction or curing that has been made or the kind of uh, that uh, material, especially steel and serviceability things that uh, hardly we take note of these things. We only come or become alive only when things fail, but you find it that it gives certain kind of warning. So, uh, but when things has happened, uh, there is to be some kind of uh, no, community say awareness campaign to be done and here you see something has happened here how to collect data or information after failure of a facility facility means there is something in lower ninth ward just i'm reading for just for uh, 
example say during hurricane uh, katrina witness levy brax have photos videos please call toll free this event happened in 2005 in those days yes more than uh, you know uh, 2005 means uh, 17 years back at that time we didn't have this uh, so many whatsapp and other things internet and everything it was not accessible so at that time you see authorities whose facility has been broken they are appealing to the people putting such kind of poster on the on the roadside or wherever it is and you know we see so many posters this this day uh, these days decorating our uh, cities and roads and days for the worthless uh, 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 say uh, things that we do but when we look at the disaster management point of view preparedness point of view then we have to ask ourselves that how to collect the information collecting information is just not like that some format you make and send the students collect the data how are you how long have you been there and put them and put them in the google form and getting those pie chart bar chart and other things so it has become a fashion in our uh, most of the academia and other things so but when such thing, Google form and other things were not there, then what are the kind of approaches the agencies or responsible organization made more than 17 years back? And what kind of, you know, this is what that failure has occurred, giving such kind of, you know, uh, it is that ninth ward you see. It is the details is here. Uh, details is industrial canal flood wall, the breach of the industrial canal and other during the hurricane Katrina created a pivotal moment in American history when flood wall designed and built by U.S. Army Corps of Engineers failed. You see that such a poster is there. And the flooding from the beach bridge here killed hundreds, destroyed homes, toppled trees, and forever altered the fabric of the historic lower ninth ward. And the disaster forced the army corps to issue new guidelines in revis. New guidelines in Levy building, which improved safety for residents all across the country. So this is the kind of post that they have put up with a folded hand, they have appealed to the public and giving a very succinct description that what has happened due to what, how it has happened. So appealing to the and historic, you see, we felt we feel compassion to whoever is affected by flood or anything. It is not the question of compassion or anything. It is rather sequentially they are trying to collect information and giving a such kind of sta statement by a responsible agency. So we have to ask ourselves that how long it will take to become responsible, whether we are in the academia or even in the servicing agency. And just in contrast to that cyclone that happened in Sundarban area, or uh, these bricks are the failed measures. There are several crores are being spent up taking such kind of measures and Cyclone Amphan or Cyclone Yash, especially last year, has exposed the vulnerability. Now look at the vulnerable things over here by a photograph here, rather than seeing the table and where we decorate many of the calculation and data and statistics, predictions and, and, and uh, drawing the some dotted line and showing the trend and other things. How much realistic this is that what is vulnerability? So in that case, this is the failed measures. This is the failed measures. And we, if we don't learn these things, and when this is a failed measures, what is the, what is the most important measures that to be taken up? So in that case, oh yeah, time is uh, up. Okay. So these bricks are to be replaced by whatever glass, grass plant like this. You see, similar kind of things where these are failing, we are using natural measures. This is in West Bengal itself. Several hundred kilometers of West Bengal roads have been constructed using this. But how many of us 
have the cognizance of doing this. So we have to see that in the in the state itself there are certain measures taken which we show in many places, and then still we do such kind of measures. Still we go for such kind of failure, and still we allow the farm land to be inundated by salt water, and we just uh, look at like this. Oh, uh, mother, uh, just we become hopeless. So what are the measures to be taken? And you see that there are again some more bricks which are failing already. They are in store to be placed in. So uh, let us not talk about too much because it is all we know, circular economy and other things. Let us not talk on those level. And how to stop this water entering into the hinterland? Just I'll take this, just taking a, now how, what are the bonds to be made? How their health to be maintained? What are the measures to be taken? Whether any water leakage is happening or not, seepage is happening or not, how much, how it is to be designed. These are all well known. And how it communication can be kept break free, how they should not uh, be. And then what kind of measures is to be taken in this manner in order to protect this road and this side? What are the slopes to be taken? For just only I wanted to share, share that why so much of water should come 60 kilometer inside or even in Calcutta, when it is a three meter, four meter, five meter of storm surge uh, during cyclone or six meter of storm surge cyclone, why it should travel 100 plus kilometer inside the river or even in the Sundarban area, in this area. So then what kind of arrangement to arrest this water going there? It is only three meter, four meter, five meter high. So what can, it is just only uh, that if we make some kind of embankment, flexible embankment here and there, we can save entire of this area. We can save, uh, if we make here Diamond Harbor or whatever in this area, we can save entire Calcutta from such kind of, and we can have a control measures on the search into that or ingress of seawater and other things. Of course, for Polagat, yes, there is a special purpose to get the hills of fish. So we can have some kind of control measures here itself so that entire Calcutta flood can be taken up uh, with, uh, with certain kind of embankments in this manner or in this manner. Okay, I think uh, time is enough. And uh, I would say that there are many ways that we can save our cities also. Uh, this is being done. You see that how water is being pulled up over here or even in our localities and everything, not a single drop of water is there. Or even we can save in this manner, even in the in a remote area also. So uh, I would say that uh, some kind of resilience measures in our cities, and these are not at all costly. These are affordable, and there are many examples are there, rather than crying uh, that, oh, it is raining and other things. There is always some way to look into this. And our cities are getting inundated in this manner. There are certain from the source itself, we have to put such kind of wall and arrangement for the design and manuals are available. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for uh, your nice deliberations. Sir has lucidly explained all the possible uh, <clears throat> resistance and resilience measures associated with. Uh, areas uh, and now i would like to uh, request uh, uh, any participant if you were interested in any question because in the chat box i find one question uh, sir would you like to address that yeah 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 uh, dr norendranath guria has asked a question how we can stop riverside unauthorized fisheries in sundarban areas because storm tides directly impact floods uh, in Sundarban areas due to un unauthorized fisheries. I don't know. I mean, I mean. Uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now you see, what is the definition of authorized and unauthorized? First of all, that it is an administrative issue. And what kind of safety? Because we are looking at uh, what kind of safety that we are ensuring for the fisheries or fishermen over there. Uh, and what are the parameters that authorities have defined these are the authorized area. So uh, in order to address that, 
see they they live there for their livelihood so first we have to ensure their uh, livelihood uh, based on which their life means uh, whatever fisheries and other so there are certain arrangement protection measures is to be taken so that their livelihood is not affected now the way that we are like voluntary index that we are defining but authorized there are in delhi also there are some authorized reg, un, uh, unregularized and and then later on you know some of the slum area is coming into uh, whatever there is no building bylaws and everything are there and they are incorporated into the municipal corporation so they are already cancerous area so there are certain kind of political and uh, you know uh, judicial some kind of overtures are there which are drugging us uh, to use such kind of word unauthorized area and other thing why what is the sanctity of this authorization and unauthorization are they safe from uh, those uh, they are not safe that is why we are saying uh, your question is they are not safe so rather let us block the fisherman to go to those dangerous side so in that way i would say that of course uh, it is a socio you know uh, administration and other problems which uh, i think it is this is not the forum that we can address that Uh, thank you, sir. Actually, uh, uh, I mean, Dr. Narendra Nath Guria is probably uh, got your answer, and I would like to request the participants please uh, answer question. I mean, request questions which are relevant to this uh, uh, course because uh, we all know that these unauthorized things happen, but uh, we are not in a position to dictate. So, I hope. Uh, uh, thank you, sir, for your nice. Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, he has written that, sir. People are cutting riverside barrier for fisheries. For fisheries. So you see, cutting. Yes, they are doing it is because it is giving them some benefit to their livelihood because they have not been made anyway reliable alternative to their livelihood. So when in that case they are cutting because that will give them certain kind of uh, you know. Say balance on their living there uh, on their own, but uh, cutting the riverside and addressing them. In fact, I did not go to some. You cut the riverside, whatever way you want, but stabilization of riverside by bioengineering, which I will take maybe some time later. In fact, we are going to Vidyasagar University uh, to to have a implementation or Kamsavati River stabilization even. Uh, using the some bioengineering so cutting the river side and then allowing to erode the river uh, it is something uh, social ethos that to be looked into so we would put some system in place even if they are cutting it is not going to aggravate the situation so that kind of medicine is also there uh, which maybe uh, i have no later slides i have but now time is up but there are some bioengineering method Is there so if you, you cut it whatever way you want, it is not going to be aggravated. That kind of measures are also there. Okay, thank of you, course, thank you. Sir. Indiscriminate cutting should not be allowed, but there is nothing that should not be allowed should be allowed. It is that we have to see that whether it is going to be more vulnerable or not. That we have to assess. That side. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir, for your nice uh, derivation. so uh, after this lecture uh, i i don't find any other question in the chat box so we will directly move on to the next uh, lecture in this session which will be delivered by dr sunjeev bandopadhyay deputy director general of imd so uh, sir uh, sir is there so uh, <clears throat> uh, before uh, Uh, this i would like to introduce dr sunjeev bandopadhyay so uh, holding the post of deputy director general of metrology and working as head of eastern region covering the states of west bengal bihar jharkhand odisha and andaman and nicobar islands and sikkim in india uh, dr sunjeev bandopadhyay is looking after the metrological department of government of india he has 20 years of long forecasting experience in different fields of metrology including tropical cyclones which strikes the east coast and uh, uh, most of the tropical cyclones on which he has uh, been able to forecast uh, are the recent cyclones of foni bulbul amphan and yas 
uh, and we all know that uh, effective disaster management in the affected states have been carried out. Dr. Bandopadhyay was instrumental in the implementation of the Gramin Krishi Mousham Seva, that is GKMS, which is a flagship project of the Ministry of Environmental Sciences in the eastern region of the country, which caters to the agrometeorological needs of the most common farmer of this region. And it, uh, Dr. Bandopadhyay has also upgraded the forecasting infrastructure and observational network in the entire eastern India region. So. Uh, we all know that how difficult is it to uh, provide correct and timely quantity precipitation forecast in this river basin areas and uh, uh, Dr. Bandopadha has adequately carried out and uh, it, it, it has immensely helped in reservoir of operation as well as other agrometeorological uh, problems subsidy, uh, uh, reduction in the Damodar Valley area. He has authored a chapter in a book entitled South Asia's Response to Climate Change, Economic, Geographical and Political Issues, besides having a few scientific papers and reports to his credit. Dr. Bandupatha is awarded the Certificate of Merit for his outstanding contributions in the field of atmospheric science and technology by MOES. So with this, uh, I would like to request uh, Dr. Sanjeev Bandupatha to enlighten us on the topic of forecasting cyclones and disaster management. Thank you. Am I audible, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm sharing, sir. The share share content is disabled. Yes, sir. I'm 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 sharing, sir. Sorry. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think it is okay now. You can share your presentation, sir. Now it is visible. Is it, is it visible? Yeah, it is visible. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, Namaskar and good afternoon to all of you. Uh, so today's topic is the forecasting cyclone and disaster management. So basically we are concerned with the forecasting and making liaison with all these stakeholders for effective disaster management. So IMD's mission is very clear. All we are aware, we are providing mainly two types of service. One is weather service and another is climate service. The objective is also very well defined uh, to reduce the vulnerability and promote sustainable development. I think all who are aware of this terminology. So, so in uh, I will try to restrict my discussion with the East Coast and Eastern India. So major weather system that affect our region is monsoon that is from June to September. Local severe storm popularly known as Kalboishaki uh, that is in March, April, May. Western disturbance that is basically in the winter time phenomena of January, February. As today's topic is tropical cyclone, we have two cyclone season. One we call the pre monsoon cyclone season, that is April, May, and another is the post monsoon cyclone season, that is October, November. During monsoon, normally no cyclone occurs, but rare cases are there. One or two systems we have that occurred in the Monsoon system also. So, <clears throat> type of forecast we are issuing mainly the now cast uh, that is for few hours, then short range, medium range, extended range, long range, and climate prediction, depending upon the different uses of our stakeholders. So, somebody may need now casting, somebody may need short range forecasting, etc. Medium range forecasting basically we are providing for the agriculture sector. So what is the procedure forecast? How we are issuing forecast? So for any forecast, what we have to understand the initial state of the atmosphere that is called the analysis. That is the assess the present state. If we know the present state, that only we can predict the future. So that is for all observations are taken uh, and then we have analysis it. That is called the present state. Second, uh, the predict the future state by running a computer model. And third is the interpretation of the model result. 
So major steps is uh, collection of data, quality control, data assimilation, that is the initial condition, then model integration, post-processing of model forecast, forecaster, role of forecast is the interpretation, and nowadays product and graphics generation, it is also very much important, how beautifully and how effectively we can design our product through graphics and animation so that people can understand, all the stakeholders can understand. So this is our global observing system. So we have the surface observatory, we have the upper air observation, satellite, radar, then the buoy data, ocean buoy data, we are getting the ship data. So all sorts of observations we are collecting just to initialize the initial condition of the atmosphere. Then only we can predict the future. So just to get the initial condition of our atmosphere, all sorts of observations are taken from surface up to a height of say 20, 30 kilometer with satellite, radar, then uh, radiation, surface, upper air, ship, automatic weather station, manual weather station. Now straight away if we come to cyclone. Now what is cyclone? Basically uh, it is a low pressure system. Uh, having a large vortex in the atmosphere and we know the release of energy of latent heat that is the source of energy for this convective cloud which is uh, subsequently we will found that is the cyclone is prepared of a eye and wall cloud region that cloud of convective cloud that is releasing the latent heat that is the source of energy getting from the warm oceans Dimension uh, is a huge range, sometimes 150 to 1000 kilometer and height about 10 to 15 kilometers. So whatever sometimes we have seen that typhoon or hurricane, so basically all are same, that is the cyclone. But when the same thing has been formed over the Atlantic, we call it hurricane. If it is over Pacific, then we call it typhoon. If it is over the Australian Sea, then we call it willy willy or in North Indian Ocean, in our region, we simply call it a cyclone. Now it has four components. One is I, that is the center of the cyclone. Second is the wall cloud region, the, the CV cloud, which is surrounding immediately the wrapping the eye, then spiral band, rain, and the outer storm area, which you are seeing here. This is the eye, this is the eye wall, then this is the spiral band. Now, if we see the nature, nature of tropical cyclone, that is basically a migratory in character. Migratory in character because where it has formed, it has formed over ocean and ultimately hit our coast. So, it is a migratory in character uh, life cycle, uh, normally three to four days depending upon from where it has been formed. So, sometimes it forms over the extreme Andaman Sea, then the cyclone is little bit more, even up to five, six days scale is 2000 to 3000 kilometers. One advantage of cyclone forecasting is that uh, it has not formed all of a sudden. We know that cyclone has formed uh, through a process. So first, uh, if we, depending on the wind speed, uh, the low pressure area, when the wind speed is less than 17 knot, then subsequently further intensification, when it is 17 to 27, then you call it a depression then 28 to 33 depression and once it reached the 34 knots winds, then only we call it a cyclone. Before that 34 winds, it is not a cyclone. Once it reached the 34, then we call it a cyclone and give a name to it. So finally, if it's further intensified, then severe cyclonic storm, very severe, extremely severe, and finally super cyclone when it is greater than or equal to 120, these are all in knots. Now, we have two seasons. One is the pre-monsoon season and another is the post-monsoon season. Post-monsoon cyclones are severe compared to the pre-monsoon. Reason is that the most of the post-monsoon cyclone season forms over the Andaman Sea. So, for Andaman Sea to our coast, they have a long travel path. So, they have a scope for further intensification over the ocean. That's why normally the post-monsoon cyclone uh, is slightly more severe than our pre-monsoon cyclone. Now, 
for any forecast, we are using the climatology also. If you see the simple climatology, that normally this April storms that is moving towards the Arakan coast. That is a, not that all the cases it will be uh, correct or it will be matched with the climatology. But if you see the last 100 years climatology, April storms normally moves Arakan coast. But if we see May, May storms, it may hit Orisha, Andhra, and Gangetic West Bengal, including with the Bangladesh coast also. In the post monsoon October, November storms, climatology can move towards Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Orisha, Gangetic West Bengal, and Bangladesh. But extreme end of November or even sometimes early December. Normally, it hits the southern India, that is the Tamil Nadu coast. So, once that uh, say end of October, normally it is rest assured that it will not come to our coast, rather, it will go to the south coast, that is the either uh, south of Andhra Pradesh or north of Tamil Nadu, like this. So, this is our sea area. See, in RC Calcutta, though we are covering West Bengal, Bihar, Jharkhand, Orisha, Sikkim. But we have a huge sea area over which we have to issue a forecast also on daily basis. So when we say the low pressure area has formed over the southeast Bay of Bengal, this is our the blue area, this is the southeast, this is southwest, this is the central, that is the west central and east central, and in the head bay, that is the northeast bay and northwest bay and the Andaman Sea. So whenever we say in our bulletin, just something the low pressure area has formed over such and such area. So people should understand where it is actually formed. So now why we are naming a tropical cyclone? Earlier we used to give the name as per the uh, name of that location, say Paradip super cyclone. When it hits the Paradip, so we call it a Paradip super cyclone. But subsequently, there are some issues when it, in the same year, two cyclones hits in the same locations and all those things to avoid all this and to identify each individual cyclone and create awareness of its development and remove any confusion in case of simultaneous occurrence over the same region. We give a name to each and every cyclone now. now we have one institute called RIMC, that is the Regional uh, Specialized Meteorological Center, that is headquarter at Mosam Bhavan, New Delhi, under WMO. So we have 13 countries, so all 13 countries, they propose 13 names. Based on that, 160 names list has already been published and available in the website. So depending on that list, the name of a cyclone is given when it occurs. So, out of that 169, 13 names given by India, 13 by Sri Lanka, then Pakistan, Bangladesh. In that way, name of 160 has been already prepared. Now, if we see the structure of tropical cyclone, we, we can see in both from uh, through satellite, we are getting mainly the horizontal structure. And if we see through radar, then we are getting a vertical structure. So, if we see the satellite picture that is from the top, if we see the horizontal structure, this is the eye and this is the eye wall immediately uh, wrapping the eye, then spiral band and this is the outer storm area. So, it's a rotating about its own axis and at the same time it has two motion, one is called rotational motion and another is called translational motion. While rotating it moves. So, it's a basically a rotating system of cloud, a great vertical heat engine. A source of energy is mainly the condensation of water vapor, that is the release of latent heat. And force is basically the gravity and the Coriolis force. That's why normally tropical cyclones do not form within 5 degree of equator, because within the 5 degree of equator, Coriolis force is very less. And without this Coriolis force, this rotation will not develop. So, I, now if we take one by one, I basically a circular area, but this is very important for the disaster managers or even for the common people because I is a fair weather region. Wind is generally calm and even in case of night, if it is uh, say crossing coast in night, sometimes one can see the stars also because no rain is there, very light rain, wind is very calm, fair weather. So, people sometimes assume that the danger is over. 
but actually what happened as it is a circular uh, shape cyclone so half of the system when cross coast and particularly when eye is crossing over your region it appears that everything is over but actually what happened immediately after crossing coast uh, crossing the center to your area you will hit by the second uh, the, the another semicircular region of that particular cyclone so you will again face the similar type of uh, dangerous weather so that's why we said that uh, until or unless the imd issues d warning so one should not take in that the danger is over <coughs> This is the wall cloud region. This is the source of the maximum wind. Whatever gale winds that we are facing during cyclone, this is generating from this wall cloud region. This is a very deep convection. Those who are accustomed with our Kalboishaki or Norwester, you can say, say thousands of such uh, Norwester clouds wrapping the eye, that is the wall cloud region. This is a very narrow band. Spiral band. Its spread is very high. Say rainfall intensity will be equally heavy to very heavy, but wind speed definitely will be less than the wall cloud region. Outer storm area that is beyond that uh, rain region, here rainfall will also be less and wind will also be very, very less. Now, if you see through vertical structure through radar, then we can see the uh, initially when the low pressure area is formed, wind from all direction is coming and there is a cyclonic rotation that is the anti-clockwise at the surface and at the top it will be a clockwise divergence, what we call the convergence at the lower level and the divergence at the upper level. And now why the eye is come? Because eye, there is a basically a subsidence of air. Whenever air is ascending, then only you will get the weather. If the air is subsidizing, then you will not get that weather. Rather, you will get the calm weather. That's why during winter, uh, we are getting the subsidence of air and we have very calm weather. <coughs> Same thing is showing here also. So first layer that is called the inflow layer uh, that is basically up to the three kilometer height. So from surface to three kilometer that is the inflow takes place from all direction towards the center. Uh, basically uh, these are all the radial wind. And in the middle layer that is from three kilometer to 7.6 kilometer these are basically the tang tangential wind. And outer flow that is beyond 7.6 kilometer from the top of the storm that is basically a clockwise, that is the anticyclonic outflow is around 12 kilometers is maximum. The same thing we can see here, this is the eye initial, that is the inflow layer, and this is the middle layer, and this is the outflow. <coughs> now, what are the conditions uh, required for the formation of a tropical cyclone? Uh, we need uh, the main source of energy, the warm ocean. So sea surface temperature should be at least minimum 26 degree or more. But not only the sea surface temperature, the ocean heat content that is up to the depth of 50 meter, the temperature should be very high. Then atmosphere should be potentially unstable. Potentially unstable means that is the air should go up. Then availability of moisture up to the metropospheric level sufficient Coriolis force that is within five degree of equator uh, there is not sufficient Coriolis force that's why cyclones are done generally not formed within that and fifth point is also most important that is the low vertical wind shear that is the low vertical wind shear means the wind difference of wind speed between the surface and the upper layer if the vertical wind shear is more we know that uh, it's a rotating vertex, a vertical structure. That structure will not survive if the upper air wind speed is more. So it will always cut off the head portion. So it will not survive. So if there is a less difference of wind speed between the surface and upper layer, then the system will stabilize. So, but this condition, what we are telling, definitely are uh, required, but these are not uh, necessary and not uh, necessary but not sufficient. Sometimes more reasons are there that I am coming how. Normally, uh, it has been seen that during the El Nino year, 
uh, we have in the Bay of Bengal is a chance of less cyclone. Uh, but during the Lalina years, uh, there is a chance of more cyclone over the Bay of Bengal because uh, it is a warmer and more remnants from the West Pacific also. Because Bay of Bengal number of cyclone is more than the Arabian Sea, mainly because some are in situ development over the Bay of Bengal and some we are getting as a remnants from the West Pacific. Then Indian Ocean Dipole, if it is the negative IOD, that is also favorable for the Bay of Bengal for formation of a more number of tropical cyclogenesis or low pressure or depression or cyclone. Then MJO, that is the Maiden Julian Oscillation, if it is the position in phase 3, 4 and 5, then it is a west to east moving system, then also it is favorable. Then Rosby web, that is the east to west propagating web, this is also supports the vorticity. Vorticity is more, then chance of formation is more. Kelvin web, it also supports the MJO activity, but not much impact is seen directly over the cyclogenesis. Now we have a cyclone prediction system, what is called CPS for the North Indian Ocean. Now, first of all, what are the models we are using in IMD? Uh, that is the model of the GFS, WRF, HWRF, SIPC, GEFS, then GPP, SKIP model, that is mainly for the intensity prediction, MME, that is used mainly for the track prediction, then rapid intensification. Rapid intensification means if the wind speed is more than 30 knots within 24 hours, then we call this a very rapid intensification because intensification process in cyclone is very complex. Uh, sometimes it becomes stationary and slowly intensified. Sometimes it becomes very fast intensification and decay after landfall. So these are the different models in IMD we are using. Besides that, we are also seeing the output of the ECM, WF, GMA, NSEP, GFS, UCOMET, and within our MOES organization, NCMRF, WF, and IITM input also. So advantage of cyclone forecasting in today is that nobody, we can assure each and everybody that's 15 days, at least 15 days in advance, we issue an outlook for cyclogenesis every Thursday, whether there is a chance of formation of any system in our bay, that every 15 days interval, we are giving this extended range outlook every, sorry, weekly for 15 days every Thursday. Then five days probabilistic cyclogenesis, that issued daily, track intensity and structure forecast five days issued from depression stage and three hourly when from the cyclone stage. Impact based heavy rainfall, wind, etc., for five days. Hourly update, 12 hour update, or even we can issue our hourly bulletin when the system is within the radar range, that is within 200 kilometer range. Then only we can use the hourly bulletin also. So, this cyclone forecasting is a four stage warning system. Uh, this is the pre-cyclone watch. Pre-cyclone watch, the day when we sure that there is a system likely to form, immediately we communicate that information to the Chief Secretary of the Constant Stent, not to media and others. Subsequently, we alert, uh, issue the cyclone alert, warning, post-landfall outlook and due warning message. Now, genesis probability, that is most important. So 15 days advance, if we are in a position to say that something is going to form. So what we see, the sea condition, the conditional instability, whether any pre-existing disturbance like a sterling wave or so, what is the environmental condition, that is the wind shear, then what are the different uh, numerical model, dynamical statistical model and other statistical model, then we have a consensus approach that what is the chance of probability of formation of a system. So if we see there is a no chance, then we say nil. If there is a low probability, we say low, moderate or high, depending upon the our, uh, conditions for formation of a tropical cyclone. So if the system fulfills all the criteria, then we say the accordingly the probability is very high for a tropical cyclogenesis. So NW based objective cyclone system, the first one is cyclogenesis, 15 days in advance, then track step two, intensity step three, step four is the rapid intensification and step five is the decay after 
landfall. Some system uh, uh, rapidly decayed immediately after landfall, particularly in the post monsoon season. Uh, in the uh, sorry pre monsoon season and the post monsoon season when there is a sufficient moisture over the land area immediately after monsoon that time decay may be slightly slow so tropical cyclogenesis mainly to understand the potential zone of cyclogenesis and potential for further intensification into a cyclone for that, normally uh, we are monitoring two dynamic variables like low level vorticity and vertical wind shear and thermodynamic variables like the middle layer tropic, uh, relative humidity and the mid tropospheric instability. These things are monitored daily basis, the, whether there is a chance of formation of a, any system or what is the genesis potential parameter, what you call the GPP. Then second is the track prediction all the different models that are 12 hourly give us the forecast latitude and forecast longitude based on that we issue uh, the track in this connection i can say the uh, for any cyclone forecast two things are very important one is the track that is where is the landfall when it will landfall and second is the intensity which is more difficult that what will be the wind speed at the time of landfall or what will be the intensification process whether it will be rapidly intensified or slowly intensified based on that we have to say when it will hit the coast that is the tropical cyclone intensity prediction intensity i think still there is some scope to work uh, more or less our track is correct uh, reasonably correct but intensity there is a scope to further development so intensity prediction uh, we are doing through the skip model these are the parameters we are seeing maybe with two technical that is the what is the intensity change in the last 12 hours what is the vorticity at 850 storm motion speed divergence at 200 hectopascal initial storm intensity initial storm latitude position sea surface temperature and vertical wind shear and fourth is the rapid intensification or RI, that is the uh, when the intensity changed by 30 knots during 24 hour speed, then we call the rapid intensification. Similarly, the parameters are monitored. Now, how we are monitoring? So, this is the forecast. Once we issue a forecast, suppose we issue a forecast that in Amphan it will hit the our Sundarban area, then continuously we have to update the bulletin and we are monitoring the entire system either through the satellite when it is over the ocean and beyond our radar range. <clears throat> when it is within our radar range, we can monitor through both satellite and radar. Besides, we have a synoptic chart and chain chart. Then this buoy data over Bay of Bengal and the ship data that also helps us a lot to get the actual observation, whatever forecast we are issuing and what is the actual wind and what is the actual observation over the ocean area. Though number is very few, but that few data is also uh, at times very useful for validation of our forecast, uh, the buoy data and ship, ship data also. And finally, the numerical weather prediction as every new model run will give us a new update. So satellite, uh, although we are aware, uh, we have a visible, we have a infrared satellite, we have a sounder, we have imageries. So through IMD in set 3D, we are monitoring. So these are the buoy data over our region. Bay of Bengal, you see, is more than the Arabian Sea. So this buoy data is very helpful uh, the, during the monitoring of the after immediate left of forecast. The radar uh, basically helps us very give us accurate forecast than satellite because it is within 200 kilometer to 250 kilometer though we can see up to 400 kilometer but very uh, clearly or pinpoint precise location center everything can be determined by the radar when it is within the 200 to 250 kilometer range by our S band of Laro weather radar. Now, what are the weather associated with the tropical cyclone? Basically, the major uh, associated weather is the gale wind speed, storm surge, and the heavy rain. Quite naturally, uh, people living in the coastal areas or the coastal districts where it hit, actually, they will get all these three, storm surge, wind, and rain. But slowly, slowly, as the system goes interior, 
the wind speed will decrease, storm surge will not be there, however heavy rain will be there. If you go further interiors, then wind will also be less, storm surge definitely will not be there, but rain will still continue. So these are the three major weather we are getting. And sometimes what happens during this uh, cyclone uh, when hitting coast, there is a uh, chance of formation of a tornado in ahead, mainly uh, because the when it hit the coast, the because of the friction or the drags of the land area, the wind speed suddenly decreases at the surface level, but there is a wind speed at the top level remains same. So this large vertical wind shear that will form the tornado in ahead of the system uh, that is we call sometimes a mesocyclone. So pre-cyclone watch, uh, cyclone alert. So what are the bulletin we are issuing? Mainly the sea area bulletin, coastal weather bulletin, bulletins for Indian Navy, fishermen, port, aviation, bulletins for the departmental exchange, bulletins for the IER, press, media, etc., etc. So sea area bulletin, uh, mainly we are giving for the merchant ships, then coastal bulletins, Navy, Coast Guard. Now GMDS bulletin, mainly for the ships flying at high seas, Fleet forecast, fisherman warning, and port warning. Fisherman warning normally when the wind speed exceeds 45 kilometers and the height of the soil or wave is more than 3 meters, we issue the fisherman warning uh, normally. But whenever the, any low pressure system like low or depression or tropical cyclone, that time also we are issuing now five, four times in a day in a normal time. During the cyclone, we issue at every three hourly interval. Not only the own coast, now we are issuing that not to venture in the nearby coast also. Suppose cyclone is in the West Bengal coast also, so the nearby Bangladesh coast or additional warning of the deep sea like the Northeast Bay or East Central Bay that we also be providing to the fishermen because sometimes fishermen, they go beyond their area. This is the port warning signal we are advising to each and every port to hoist at their port. These are different signal. So by that signal, they can understand that what to do and where the system is. Suppose uh, in a, for a particular port system is far away. So we say depression at far away, so DC1. But now it is a cyclone, but still it is far away, then it is DW2. Similarly, say for D5 that a cyclone likely to cross coast keeping port to its left whether port will be left to the path or track of the cyclone or the port will be right to the path of the cyclone like this these signals are given to the port to hoist at their port so that any ship coming to that post or will leave from that post will understand the meaning of this signal this is the most important thing that is we call the cone of uncertainty because forecasting we know is a science of uncertainty so if we can identify the cone of uncertainty, then it will helpful both for the disaster managers and for the forecaster also. So see, this is the yellow and black. This is the actual path, but this balloon like green shape. This is we call the cone of uncertainty. Why we call the cone of uncertainty? Suppose the system when it is it here, say thousand or thousand or 1200 kilometer away from that coast. So if there is a even in a point zero zero one degree deviation of that path, then it may hit within this green area, not beyond that. So in from disaster management angle, what we call to R on safer side. To R on safer side means suppose uh, I am in a uh, cone of uncertainty region. So I have taken all the precautionary measures, but it has not particularly hit our coast. So one may think that the whatever the expenditure I have made, that is the wastage, but it's not like that. Suppose you have not taken any precautionary measure, but by because of uncertainty, it hit you, then there will be a huge loss compared to the expenditure we have taken as a precautionary measure. So people, those who are within this cone of uncertainty, they should be alerted within the region directly hitting the line, so they will be warned. Now, dissemination, how we are disseminating? We are using the multi-channel dissemination mechanism. Why the multi-channel? Because India, we know in such a country, 
they we cannot adopt a single measure to reach the last man in the society so we are using all possible channels like telephone mobile then your internet website radio tv newspaper uh, briefing by the senior officer myself every day 3:30 briefing to the media personally and most importantly imd is using all the latest uh, technology and tools available so we are using large scale all the social media like whatsapp facebook twitter instagram youtube channel and uh, in facebook and whatsapp in whatsapp particularly we have category wise stakeholder wise we have different whatsapp group whatsapp group for the power sector whatsapp group for the agriculture sector whatsapp group for the fisheries whatsapp group for the separate all the dms disaster managers so whatever uh, appropriate messages that we transmit through whatsapp advantage is that not only we send the text messages we can send our radar picture our satellite images everything and very recently we have started using the common alert protocol or cap so this is the i can show you the observ track of amphan uh, which hit coast uh, during uh, actually hit 20th may uh, it was from 16 to 21 2020 uh, within that uh, pandemic period of covid uh, see this black portion is our the observed and the red is the forecasted track so this is a very typical case uh, our track forecast was 100% correct in case of amphan not that all the cases it will be 100% correct but it was almost 100% correct in case of amphan uh, so this is the observed track you see this is the red portion here whatever the black portion is observed red is the forecast similarly within the track also we are providing the wind field also so what will be the wind speed all along the track just at the time of landfall this is the dwr kolkata picture many of may be aware that uh, the new secretariat building in the stand road we have a doppler radar radar so this is the images of that radar uh, at the time of landfall of cyclone amphan see this is the eye of the amphan crossing kolkata at 1142 utc so it after hitting shagor island it directly goes over kolkata so these are some important observation of dwr kolkata uh, we can analyze this and see the exact location the wind speed the height of the cloud uh, from both uh, north uh, south projection and east west projection now this is the observation we have from the paradeep radar when it is from below the our coast so as all along the east coast we have the radar so no system can escape our radar eye so from the paradeep radar from the starting we are observing this amphan how it is moving so this is the system through our paradeep radar similarly these are the satellite picture through our insat 3d uh, that is on 1157 IST of 18th May 2020. See, so this is eye is very clearly visible. The red region. This is what we call the wall cloud region. This is the spiral band, and this is the outer storm area. This is the bluish and. now most important is the storm surge, which is most uh, damaging thing in case of cyclone only hit coast. Uh, this forecast track we given we are getting from inquires uh, that is in hyderabad that is a sister organization of ministry of arts science so normally the track right side there will be more storm surge compared to the left side because if we see a cyclone moving anti clockwise at the same time it moving towards north then in the right sector there will be more wind because it has the radial component that is moving at the same time it is moving towards the radial component plus the translational component so the right sector is called the back sector of the cyclone so where the storm surge will be more this is also the data we get from the inquires this is a simple animation you can see how this system moves towards our coast
very clear eye huh? now effective multi hazard and early warning so earlier uh, in case of cyclone though we are providing from the impact based from the very beginning but now with the entire imd we have switched from the information based forecasting to impact based forecasting earlier we see used to say there will be heavy rain like this now we can say what that heavy rain will do now whether where whether water logging in low lying areas or damage of vulnerable structure so earlier we gives normally the what is the observation what is the forecast and warning now we are issuing observation forecast expected impact what will be the impact of our forecast and the risk based warning so now imd has already switched from information based forecasting to impact based forecasting in all cases including the cyclones now you see this is the weather information we are providing then extraction of the relevant information from that bulletin and what is its impact so impact estimation is most important depending on the threshold value of that particular uh, uh, weather and what is the response scenario so it can help that analysis and forecasting data then impact estimation that is the placing the situation into context and response scenario then what will be the mitigation strategies See, see, same thing if we can place it in a different way, uh, because we know that as per the global framework of climate service, the major priority areas is our agriculture, disaster risk reduction, energy, health and water. So if you see, this is the hazards and this is our exposure, uh, mainly the population, the agriculture, the water, health, energy. Then within this exposure community, what is the vulnerability status, uh, child, women, uh, elderly people, farmers, low income group, high income group, and what is its potential impact? That is the risk hotspot, then how many number of people exposed, and what is this potential impact on agriculture, energy, health, and water? So one example I can tell you uh, during the Amphan, <coughs> that that time Boro Paddy was in the field of entire West Bengal uh, in a very ripening stage or near harvesting stage. As we have been able to issue the cyclone forecast at least six to seven days in advance, and we have categorically advised all the farmers to harvest their crops. And immediately after passing over the cyclone, we got a message from the Ministry of Agriculture, Government of India, uh, West Bengal, that because of that early warning, that 70 to 80 percent of the crops have been able to harvest. Otherwise, entire Podo Boro Paddy was wasted. So this is the map uh, that is, uh, you know, that is the cyclone risk mitigation project by the Ministry of Home. Uh, that uh, what is the area likely to be affected? Then depending on the wind speed, how much population they will be affected. Uh, that is both for Bangladesh and India, they are prepared. So from that, uh, the managers, they can see that what will be the wind speed in which area and how much population will be affected. Not only that, uh, what are the different vulnerability index also? Uh, suppose the human development index, uh, they have prepared. Uh, these are very much uh, useful uh, for uh, taking any action or uh, which area are likely to be affected, where the most vulnerable people are there, which area is the most exposed. So they have taken poverty, income, literacy, and other vulnerability indicators uh, which are appropriate. So among all these things, uh, if we see for the last few years or decades, that number of disaster event is increasing, including all natural disaster, if we see, the number of disasters evening is increasing only positive thing is that if we see the loss of human life is drastically reduced. Even if we see the Paradip super cyclone, if there is a loss of death of 10,000 in Amphan, it will be less than a double digit. So that is the most positive thing uh, that the, uh, though the number of disastrous event is increasing, but number of death is reducing, though it is very difficult to reduce the loss of property right now. Uh, but at least uh, for the last few cyclones, which I have handled in, in RC Calcutta, there's not a single uh, 
uh, loss of life of fishermen, those at sea. Earlier, what we used to see that a lot of fishermen were uh, endangered during the cyclone, either because of the non-communication of the forecast in due time to the them. Now, Coast Guard, they are playing a very good role. The Fisher, Director of Fisheries, Government of West Bengal, they are playing. And we have very good communication, mainly uh, coordination and understanding with all the stakeholders. So not only the very good forecast will help to reduce the loss of type until or unless we have a very good coordination. Fortunately, right now, because with the NDMA, NDRF, then state government, SDRF, all stakeholders, we are in a very tight layer. So uh, starting from the very beginning, resulting to reduce the at least the loss of life of people to a large extent through our early warning system. So if we see the cyclone mitigation measure, uh, then uh, this is for our part, the early warning components uh, that basically uh, needs skill in monitoring and prediction of cyclone. Uh, more correct the forecast, uh, uh, more easier for the disaster manager to handle the situation. Then not only the correct forecast, whatever products we are generating, uh, that is also that should be very effective earning uh, effective warning products and quickly dissemination. Fortunately, after the mobile uh, now dissemination is not a very major issue. So we have made a survey after the fun and we got that uh, not a single household was in West Bengal was there. Those who are not aware of that fun is coming. So coordination with the emergency response units that we are, we are doing on a regular basis. And finally, the public perception about the credibility of the official prediction. This is most important. Earlier, what happened, if there is any system form in the Bay of Bengal, people have an idea that it will go to Bangladesh finally. So uh, they have not relied on our forecast and like this. But slowly, slowly, that perception has changed. And now if we say that, no, it will not go to Bangladesh, it will hit Calcutta, then people are started believing our forecast. So that is also very important, that public perception about the credibility of our official uh, prediction. Uh, but finally, what is most important is the knowledge and preparation. That is the keys to survival in the event of catastrophe. So for that, we required uh, the database, the technological needs, the early warning system, the communication infrastructure, the logistics and emergency preparedness. Now we have a uh, monitoring mechanism like this from all we are getting data from the radar, satellite, upper air, we are daily monitoring. <laughs> then forecast track and intensity, will there be alert and warning? If we say yes, then we issue, otherwise again start monitoring that is on daily and routine basis we are doing starting from the 15 days in advance from a cyclogenesis. So this is our uh, exclusive website, that is the Regional Specialized Meteorological Center, headquartered at Mosom Bhavan Lodi Road. One can get all the bulletins, images, information, model output, everything in this specialized uh, meteorological center for tropical cyclone. Thank you, sir. Thank you. If there is any question, I can answer or otherwise I should quit. Thank you, sir, uh, for your excellent presentation. Uh, we are. Uh, am, I, am I within the time or I have exceeded the time? I think. No, sir, it's actually within the time. So, uh, actually, we, we learned a lot about cyclones and their forecasting. Sir, actually, there are some questions. So, yeah. again, Dr. Narendranath Guria has asked a question. Um, I'll just read it. In fact, he has asked three questions. I'll just go one by one. So, first question which he put forward is that uh, sometimes the storm tide is highly effective and sometimes it is normal. So, uh, can you repeat? Repeat. Uh, sir, I'll just repeat. Uh, uh, sometimes the storm tide is highly effective and sometimes it is normal. So, he is asking for your opinion and uh, also he is asking why there is uneven rainfall during the recent Indian monsoon, especially in central in, uh, India, specifically the states of Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh and Maharashtra. Yeah, so first of all, uh, question is first question is not very clear. However, uh, what I feel that uh, people should understand the difference between a storm surge and total tide. OK, so. In general, if there is no cyclone also, there is a, always a normal tide and wave. So the most disastrous things happen when this astronomical tide and our storm surge coincides. Suppose uh, 
during the Yash cyclone, uh, the it happens to be in the uh, astronomical tide date. The highest maximum normal astronomical tide level was say three meter. Above and over and above that, there is a four meter storm surge. Then effective height will be seven meter. So if there is no astronomical tide, then storm surge will only be four meter. So in that way, if it coincides with the astronomical tide level, then really it is very dangerous. Rather than wind, that time that water which is entering into the land area, that is more dangerous. What has happened in case of yes cyclone? Then second, uh, the height of the storm surge it depends on the wind speed that at which whether it will hit your coast as a very severe cyclone or extremely severe cyclone like that. So in case of Puri, Puri the phony cyclone, it hit the coast as an extremely severe cyclone. That's why height was more. But in case of Amphan, though it was a super cyclone over ocean, but when it actually hit our coast, the intensity was a very severe cyclone. That was that's why height was not that much height with the as expected in case of an extremely severe cyclone. Second question is the rainfall is concerned. See, normally this area will get rainfall when a low pressure area has formed in our bay and it moves towards west. So this particular 2022 monsoon, whatever low pressure area or circulation that has been formed, that is in the coastal Odisha, not even the our West Bengal coast. In West Bengal, Bihar also are not getting rain. So as this system, uh, our trap, monsoon trap is south of its normal position, uh, that is almost uh, towards the end of the southern region, uh, where it is passing through Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat, Orisha and Chhattisgarh. And naturally, this area will get the maximum rain. And this year, uh, the trap position for during this July first half or the first 15 days, almost it was permanent over this area, this Bhubaneswar, Orisha, Chhattisgarh, MP and Gujarat. So this area will get rain and we in West Bengal and Bihar, we are not getting any rain. Okay. Okay, sir, uh, sec second question has been put by uh, Dr. Uh, Prakash Mistri. Uh, so uh, he has asked how to, to, how to do the cross track analysis of a tropical cyclone. How to? how to carry out the cross-track analysis of a tropical cyclone? I, what we do normally at the end of uh, every cyclone season, what we call the ACR, that is our annual cyclone review meeting. So in that time, we actually, whatever forecast we have given and what has actually happened, that is the final track finalization, what we called, and we uh, see the best track. I don't know what exactly the question, but what this exercise we do every year. Okay, sir, I think it's clear. Uh, and uh, Rajot Chakravarti has asked, what is ocean buoy data? Buoy data, these are basically automatic weather station. If you put it over land, then you call the automatic weather station AWS. If you put it over ocean, you call it the buoy. These are automatic weather station transmitting the data not only the atmospheric data, even the wave data also uh, directly to the satellite and we are getting it at inquiries in downlink. Basically, these are all observatory floating over ocean. Okay, sir. These are the actually relevant questions which have been put. Uh, uh, so, thank you, sir, from the core of my heart uh, for uh, interacting with us. So, we are really enriched by uh, by your uh, lecture. So, thank you, sir. Should I quit? I, yes, sir. I, you can, uh, uh, I mean. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank, uh, thank you, Dr. Jana. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. We follow you. I mean. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Nice presentation. I so mean, I myself. Huh? And, uh, all the participants have been benefited a lot. Okay, actually, Excellent. time is is the limitations factor. That's, otherwise, if we can detail uh, with a single presentation, then I think it will be more elaborative, and we can take more questions. Also, people might have more questions, but as we are 
not able to allow much time to interact. We have to somewhere stop. Anyway, thank you for inviting me. Hmm. I mean, an idiom they gave. Uh, I am uh, just. I am so happy to see you. And this is one of the finest lecture that I have been able to attend, especially from the IMD. Thank you, sir. So thank, thank you for uh, giving a very specific uh, information uh, about the work that IMD has been doing. And also, the last few slides that you have shown that how uh, impact based uh, information uh, yes, gives a, a window for preparedness. Yes, sir. like you have given the example for uh, Bodo, uh, Paddy. Yeah. Uh, Bodo uh, that uh, things that uh, which they have done in advance. And moreover, it is an international like in Bangladesh or on this in those area, giving them advanced information and also bringing in inquiries information into your yeah. things, uh, which is something I think that in our uh, education system also. Yeah. Uh, you have, uh, because it is Ministry of Art Science, you are also in the Ministry of Art Science. Even I also worked uh, one and a half years in uh, AMD, Calcutta, in uh, Delhi, okay. of course, on earthquake area, when earthquake risk evaluation center was created. Not on this, but your presentation has uh, given a momentum to us, especially in the disaster management, uh, that how IMD has come from information-based to uh, impact-based uh, forecasting, uh, which is very particular and very, very well uh, described, taking data from inquiries also, which is our uh, Ministry of Art Science, the very important organization created, especially after uh, this tsunami, uh, uh, that they have created that inquiry tsunami warning system in 2007. Uh, so that way, uh, your presentation has given a really a great insight for the students, especially who are attending over here, uh, uh, that to take up their projects and research uh, with the coordination with you and MOES and NIDM all together. And in fact, this is the purpose of having such kind of interaction uh, from NIDM side. And uh, I'm very happy to see uh, you uh, in position in this Thank way. You, sir. Thanks a lot. Whenever I visit Calcutta, I must. Yes, sir, you. sir. You are always welcome. Come to our. Uh, last week very... I was in Calcutta, but now I make it a point that to see yeah. you. Sir, and... we have a very guest good up, uh, guest house also. There will be no issue. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank yeah. you, sir. Thanks a lot. So I am quitting with all your permission. So please allow me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, so now we have the last lecture of today. It will be delivered by Professor Lakshmi Narayan Satpati. So, sir will be speaking on role of local governments and NGOs in disaster preparedness and management. So, before that, I'll take a few minutes to introduce Professor Satpati. Professor Lakshmi Narayan Satpati is currently the Professor and Director of UGC Human Resource Development Center, University of Calcutta. Previously served the Department of Geography, Cal University of Calcutta as the Professor and Head. Professor Satpati is at present the Honorary Editor of the Indian Journal of Landscape System and Ecological Studies, brought out biannually by the Institute of Landscape, Ecology and Ecospics, Calcutta or Kolkata. His specialization includes climate science, earth surface process, disaster management, and regional development and planning. Meeting at a Jodish Huntenapari to sorry, Mapkore Devan. He has to his credits more than 23 years of teaching and research experience in the field of higher education. So, sir, with due respect, I would request you to uh, kindly start your presentation. Thank you. So much is so let me share the screen. Uh, is it visible? Is my screen visible? No, sir. Not yet, not yet. Not yet, not yet. Not yet, okay. So screen one. Now it will be visible. I think so. Okay, I think, huh? 
Yeah, now it is visible. Okay, yes, sir, thank yes, you. So let me make it full screen. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so thank you. I, I am really thankful to the organizers for giving me a chance to discuss a little bit about some other aspects of a disaster. Because you know, disaster, that may be a natural event coming from the hazards or maybe anthropogenic. And it has many scientific issues, but most importantly, disaster has social relevance. And that's why there is a scope for politics also. And if we don't understand or rather set it aside the politics of disaster or disaster politics, then a major area will remain or it's untouched. And that's why I have found that uh, I should say something on the participation of the local governments and also the various voluntary organizations, how and in what way they did earlier and what they are doing right now and how they are going to do their business in future as well. Because in that way, we have to prepare our disaster plans and the management systems. I'm going to give some examples from the South Bengal experience because we are discussing about the floods as a consequence of cyclone in this particular area. But not necessarily we are going to restrict ourselves within this region. There are many interesting cartoon pictures of disaster planning that whether in the first place we are going to bark or going to bite. So this is very important. Those who barks seldom bites and those who bite, they seldom bark. In disaster planning, particularly at the grassroots level where communist community participation, vulnerability issues, capacity building, resilience, these are very much important and we must understand from our formal setup of the political economy and particularly within the uh, setup of our representation, that is the people's representation. So, that's why it's not changing. Uh, no, sir, we are still at the first slide. Yeah, it should be changed. Uh -huh. It's not changing. Why? Just a minute. Not changing. Okay. So, uh, here we are. That means in India and in South Asia, and already this place is heavily crowded. The population density is very high. And uh, the exposure of huge number of population, and if the population demographically, socially and economically, they are relatively poor, definitely they are going to be vulnerable. In that sense, the Southeast Asia, South Asia and East Asia, this region, not only it has so many types of vulnerabilities from the endogenetic forcing and also from the cyberial processes and also the atmospheric processes that occur, but the exposure of huge number of vulnerable people less, with, with less capacity, definitely that accentuates the gravity of the problem. If we look into this map, then uh, we can find that, yes, so much of concentration of geophysical hazards, the meteorological hazards, hydrological hazards, and climatological hazards, they uh, together 
has huge impact on the lives and also the livelihood security options, the support systems of the people. Now coming to, we are, we are talking about these two important issues. One is the tropical cyclone followed by the consequent events of floods, waterlogging and all that. So climatic hazards in these days, they are considered to be one of the biggest and omnipresent hazards because climatic hazards have so many types of so much of magnitudes, so many variations of their dimensions, both in their time windows as well as the spatial uh, coverages. So tropical cyclones, essentially they have their origin, what we have just right now, we have learned from our Honorable uh, Sanjeev Bandupadhyay that they are essentially originating from the oceans and seas of the tropics. But whenever they come to the shore areas and inland, they play havoc. But not everyone, with the chances that some of them at certain locations, not everywhere. And these uh, tropical cyclones, they are having their arms and arsenals. That is, the they may be synchronized with the uh, tides and the storm surges, they ingress into the lands, the break, the overreach, the embankments, then inundates, and the physiography of the land surface, the configuration of the coastlines, they are also very, very important. It is not that all the cyclones having the same types they are going to have the same type of impacts on the lands because the configuration and the type of land, land use, land cover, and the people residing there, those are the deciding factors or the determining factors. So in that way, flood is, although a consequence of tropical cyclones, they are not always a very much one-to-one uh, -one or a direct uh, impact or very linear in that sense. So they may be called pseudo-climatic hazards also. Because you know, uh, in our Khanakul area, so the lower Damodar region, uh, even if there is no cyclonic event, there can be floods because of the saucer shape of the area inherently uh, geographically or geomorphologically it is a low-lying area and then the storms coming from the south or southeast and already the low-lying areas are flooded then whenever it reaches to the catchment area of the Damodar and uh, the other plateau rivers particularly the Silai and Gandeshwari its tributary, then already the southern part is flooded. And there is also another very important issue of DVC. Although the DVC's concept was to flood control, but later on its objective shifted from flood moderation to supply of water for irrigation to the borough crops and other crops as well, then water to the power plants and also many manufacturing and industrial units of Asamsul Durgapur region, the municipal water supply and what not. So this, uh, the prime objective, uh, what was already there if it is shifted, definitely the water management plan of the Damodar Valley system has to be changed. Secondly, the uncertainty of water from the monsoon. Sometimes it happens that the South Bengal experiences early, uh, early monsoon, but sometimes it is, uh, it may be different picture. Like this year, North Bengal is getting more rain and South Bengal is relatively dry. Now, if 
uh, whatever amount of rainfall uh, the south bengal is getting if dvc doesn't uh, hold it then if the later part of the monsoon is also dry then how the water uh, will be supplied to the clients that is a very difficult issue now see if the water storage is already high in the late monsoon and then some storms are generated in the bay of bengal and uh, there are some instances in the past as well that uh, the north bay of bengal area uh, either cyclonic storms or maybe some depressions they may form and they may frequent to this area the damodar valley region then if there is huge rain then what will happen the dvc has to release the water and the low lying southern part is already flooded then what will happen and this is a very crucial uh, situation uh, almost uh, frequently dvc has to face that that means both science is there and the society or the economy if they are not very much balanced and it is very difficult to balance also because uh, the other point is that the lower damodar valley region and also the drainage systems of the sundarban and uh, the uh, east mindanao they are already ingressed and occupied by uh, human habitations or some kind of land use practices so the channels are not uh, very proper that it should be and rivers territory have already been occupied by the people because these areas the flood plains are not always flooded and the high floods the frequency of the high floods definitely uh, on statistical measure also the more magnitude the less the numbers so maybe that the high magnitude floods will occur once in 10 years or 15 years so in this time window these areas are very good for agriculture and for other purposes and if it is a seasonal activity then it's good no problem but the people have encroached upon the river beds and they have constructed some permanent structures over these areas and then what is happening that there is no room for water to pass on and that's why in major tract of the western part of forget about the bangladesh part but the western part of the ganga brahmaputra delta region and also the south of our old alluvium plain of the damodar and silai kasai system these are almost defunct that cannot carry the water so we should not blame the tropical cyclones for the floods but uh, the nature of the topography the geomorphology of the area and also the human interventions that means the transformation of uh, the virgin or near virgin landscape to mostly anthropogenic or uh, high intensity human use of uh, landscape uh, that is majorly responsible for flood followed by inundation and uh, with the consequences of uh, so many miseries like say the prevalence of the mosquitoes dengue health hazard water pollution and what not so the very purpose of damodar valley region uh, the the dvc concept uh, has somehow it has been uh, merged with uh, the poor uh, system that was developed over the years and with this there is another issue that during the last more than uh, 50 years uh, almost 6 decades uh, damodar dams are already filled with sediments so the water holding capacity has reduced 
that is another problem whether it is going to be dredged or no dredging then uh, again there are some uh, technical issues uh, if it has to be emptied that cannot be done and the cost also so there is a, a typical blame game between the state and center uh, that within the federal structure although uh, dvc is operated by uh, the both the central state and third party with some technical teams but the issue is that uh, passing the buck is easier than to take the responsibility so technical issue is there uh, which is very much linked to the configuration of the entire physical landscape of the area and also the social and economic development over the uh, decades uh, in this region so we have to understand all these issues together otherwise we, we cannot understand properly what is happening uh, in this particular context of hazard particularly the flood hazard of the region now coming to our uh, formal system of uh, the representation we expect that in our uh, preamble of the constitution uh, that is i think the most important part and the philosophy the guiding force of the entire constitution the constitution has changed but this part has been changed only once or twice but it is the most beautiful part of the indian constitution where the people uh, gives the power and people are empowered by themselves so give unto ourselves that means the people of india are the supreme authority it is not the president nor the prime minister nor the parliament nor the judiciary so it is the people but the question is whether the people has the the place in the system in our uh, different tier of governance are they being represented fully with the desired level that we have to understand and then only we can uh, assure or we can uh, just uh, try to find out that uh, whether they are going to be empowered to take certain decisions at the time of crisis particularly during hazards and disasters now the distribution of power or the action domains as per the seventh schedule of the article 246 of constitution we have the, the different uh, uh, issues or the subjects enlisted in the union list state list and concurrent list and this is very fundamental for the federal structure and very often it is found that the state governments of our uh, our country they used to blame the center or the union government there they they are unnecessarily encroaching upon uh, the some of the points uh, some of the issues of the states and the states uh, they uh, the union government on the other side they are saying that you are not taking proper decisions and proper support systems to your people because it is not your people the people are actually the people of india but what is actually happening the land you can you can find in the state list that agriculture police local government public health then land trade commerce livestock and public services they are in the state list that means the very foundation that is the land and on which the water on which the forest all the forest is in the concurrent list but forests are situated on the lands and the rivers are rich situated on the lands the people are residing on lands so land is a very important resource to the people and where the land and people they are affected by hazards so this issue is very important and we have to understand from the the constitutional frame that where we are 
trying to uh, pass the buck or where we are going to take the responsibility. When should we consider a, it as a national disaster or state level disaster? Yes, there are certain criteria, definitely, but there are indulgences that state governments often request the center to declare the disaster as the national disaster so that they get the grant or some amount of money the, and freebies in the dual politics is a very common factor in our in our uh, indian politics polity so if the money is not used and as, as it has to be then questions may be raised by the opponents and there are much scopes and in many occasions we have found whenever there are this center and uh, uh, state um, they are having this debate on certain hazards uh, the specific example we can give from amfan so uh, many many debates uh, were uh, done and without any conclusion and still uh, it is going on definitely but we have to understand whether the people who were meant for this monetary allocation for infrastructure development or for their uh, rehabilitation was actually done or not so that this this is very important now if we uh, see the national disaster management structure definitely at the helm of the affairs is the central government and the high power committee the highest level of the system is headed by the prime minister and a number of ministries are uh, associated with uh, this body the home ministry the agriculture the important ministries and the niti ayog obviously this was uh, when the planning commission was there uh, this ppt was prepared by sd up uh, but uh, yes this is important no doubt for policy making for sanction of the grants or from various uh, resource baskets but at the lowest level the community they are the people from where the money came and for whom the money should be spent at the time of need so it is not that the government of india or the state government or the district authority they are producing money and they are just giving the money to the communities under stress so it is the people's money they are just allocating so credit should go to the system definitely but to the people at large the citizens of the country who are contributing indirectly or directly and the beneficiaries if they are perpetually remaining as the takers and not the managers by themselves at the time of crisis even if it is a small crisis then definitely it is not a good governance so in that context we have to see that how our local governments they are performing or they are expected to perform at the time of disasters not at the time of the normal times so how this local governments came panchayati raj institutions or gram or village panchayats that is a three tier representation system with the gram panchayat 
then block level and district level and elected representatives they are there to take decisions on certain aspects for local resource management resource monitoring and also for some development works in case of the urban areas the nagar palikas are there in west bengal the concept was already there since 1970s but formally throughout the country it became possible with the 73rd and 74th amendment of the constitution in 1992 there was a definitely there are some backgrounds uh, of this uh, formation of this uh, panchayati raj and nagarpalika systems uh, with the initiation since 1957 with the balwant raj mehta committee and till lm singhvi committee 1986 so background works were there but what was the rationality the idea was already prescribed in the indian constitution article 40 of the directive principles of state policy when it was stated and specified that the state shall take steps to organize village panchayats and endow them with such powers and authority as may be necessary to enable them to function as units of self government so self governance is very important for empowerment of the communities and if the communities are empowered definitely the individuals are also going to be empowered otherwise why what happens even our gdp grows even our uh, per capita income grows then with the skewed distribution of income definitely certain communities particularly those who are living in the fragile ecosystems perhaps they will not be able to get the fruits of the development of the country and that's why india is still a country of paradox at certain point india is one of the superpowers is one of the biggest economies of the world perhaps fifth or sixth in terms of its volume of the total asset gdp and in terms of our space technology it is the one of the best if not the best but india is also uh, housing the highest number of poor highest number of illiterate highest number of less educated persons highest number of hungry people in the world so empowerment is also it should be linked to disaster related capacity building and if they are not resilient to certain kind of hazards definitely they will be at the mercy of the politicians and the political economy particularly the market economy will decide their fate and they will remain always vulnerable maybe that with the uh, development of science and technology the information system definitely loss of lives can be averted but the loss of property it still uh, it is found that uh, not been able to that much of a reduction of loss so then coming to the ngos who are the ngos ngos can be formed for specific purpose and there are so many ngos in our country and other countries as well based on the ethical cultural social economic political religious spiritual philanthropic scientific technological educational the ngos uh, are also the voluntary organizations if it is in the non government sector not the government they are the ngos 
and voluntary organizations that can be within the uh, governments also there's some people they can come forward even the private players they also come to as the voluntary organizations they may be community based or non government development organizations charitable organization support organization networks federation and what not so different manners the ngos can be formed and how they can be formed on the basis of the trust act of 1882 and so many trusts of private trusts the family trusts or charitable trusts they are already in existence then there can be the registered societies on the basis of different acts then non profit companies also section 8 company uh, as per the ministry of corporate affairs act 2013 then some private and public limited companies they also come forward may come forward uh, to support the people uh, at the margin under the scheme of corporate social responsibility then political parties they sometimes uh, act as ngos also because at the time of hazards or disasters they organize some relief programs although they are formed as per representation of people act 1951 under section 29a of indian constitution they have greater role to play to be represented and to represent the people's will at different government uh, tiers or systems these ngos and uh, vios can be international operating in any country like say in our oxfam they, they have done many works uh, wwf they are also they have done a good or bad that is not important but they have done works in uh, sundarban area then there can be the world bank also it is also an another type of institution intergovernmental then they can be national regional or local in south bengal there are thousands of ngos and at the time of disasters many of them they work with good intentions and some of them have been found i personally i have found that their intentions was not that good and here also problem occurs there whether some ngos will be allowed to work in certain situation that is a very crucial question that not everyone is allowed at every place and who suffers the sufferers are the persons and it was found during some of the cyclonic events in sundarban particularly that in some pockets many ngos they provided necessary help in the form of material but in some other remote pockets where the necessity was more they were not provided the much needed support systems at the time of need now coming to that the how the risks can be managed because risks are always there all regions have their risks and rewards given the sundarban or south bengal why the people are living in a certain place because there are certain rewards some resources are there but risks are always attached to any place and how the uh, risks are uh, can be measured that on the basis of the hazards or the type of hazards the magnitude the frequencies the vulnerability of the people how much capacity they have to withstand against such hazards and the exposure the number the time the way they are exposed so any kind of preparedness in a traditional system 
whenever there is any kind of hazard it occurs then definitely we are aware but that creates worry the worry has some meanings for the preparedness but that can also be translated in a positive manner that if our awareness and worry can be put together to make the preparedness more solid more robust then the risks will be less so in that way we have to understand what is there or what was there in terms of our quality of land in terms of our land use system the infrastructure the population the habits and habitats and all that and on the basis of that we have to understand the risks the risk assessment of the particular area then we have to find that the what are the mitigation measures and how in what way the preparations can be done what are the response mechanisms and recovery systems then on the basis of that certain evaluation practices can be taken up then who is going to take up these evaluation measures or all these measures at what level usually it is found that in some cases at the state level because the state polity that governs the districts and the lower rungs of the governance systems even the panchayats or the nagarpalikas but ideally where the people have the access that is the lowest rank of their area of representation that is village panchayat or nagarpalika the ward ward committee there only and if they don't have their right kind kind of planning then how they can be prepared to face the challenge of the disaster so let us uh, discuss something about our experience uh, during the recent past in the pre ila scenario many cyclonic events that occurred but in those days the technology was not very good particularly the uh, warning systems the forecasting systems and we have just understood that right now we have a very brilliant system of warning and forecasting that is not only the information based but also impact based and loss of life has reduced significantly during the recent past although some of the cyclonic events by their magnitude they were very very high and we have also found a very good teamwork during the recent past that the chief minister and her secretariat in west bengal they did very good work with a synergy with the district magistrates all the participating departments associated with the disaster there was brilliant coordination and that's why the loss of lives could be reduced and in some occasions there were almost negligible or nil there is another uh, very important issue that in earlier days whenever there was any kind of disaster particularly cyclone and uh, induced flood events we found that the mm, uh, army people had to be called and the bharat sevashram sangho or ramkrishna mission or similar organizations who were highly regimented they used to work for the distress but during the last few years we have found that government initiative with the panchayats and nagarpalikas they did very good work with lot of coordinations and pre pre disaster preparation was very good but should we be complacent with that i think no because our goals should be something beyond this the advisories of do's and don'ts pre during and post these are not enough because 
the relief rescue rescue relief and rehabilitation we we must give the focus on resilience it is not that they are distressed so rescue them take them somewhere and then give them something so that they remain permanently dependent we should make a scenario or a situation where people at the grassroots level they are resilient enough to take certain preparatory measures to take certain decisions to have some capacity to stand against a relatively moderate to a strong hazard that is going to occur almost regularly in future because the disasters are going to occur in future due to the climate change and many other associated changes in the environment so synergy is very important and this uh, is good we have found that synergy has already been built up uh, among the different stakeholders but what is missing is the preparation the perspective planning this is mi missing say for example what will be the environmental scenario in terms of the disasters and other adverse cities in the coastal region or low lying areas in the next 5 years 25 years or 50 years so these scenario based projections are very important and accordingly planning at the uh, entire for the entire area and for certain vulnerable pockets also in a larger scale then disaster education is very important and here plays the local geography should play vital role the people of sundarban should understand that cyclones may frequent and affect them in future and what is cyclone how they uh, appear and in what way they may become distressed this a solid understanding in their own way in their own language that should be understood and disaster education should be as a part of both formal as well as functional education that is we call informal it is not it is functional education and here the panchayats can play a very big role even the local schools and colleges they can impart the uh, life through the lifelong education they can impart this sort of education secondly participatory research and mapping because the local people they have something in their mental map and they understand in a different manner individually or community wise but if there there can be a participatory research with the academics the scientists and also the local people because the local people must participate in the research for their resource as well as their risks and create people's gis that is not their always machine based that can be only paper based also and the maps can be in a different manner so that everyone can understand the meanings of the maps then geo tagging of the vulnerable spots and groups and this can be done with the gis people the technicians attached to the panchayats or nagarpalikas and they can update the information on regular basis as well as real time basis sonji babu was telling that impact based weather forecasting has already been done but how that information can be used effectively by the communities that is very important one example was given that the farmers they harvested the crops there can be many other examples that 
the information was not got at real time and that's why certain losses were there which could be definitely avoided then decentralized resource management and monitoring at the panchayat as well as village level and the concept of community asset banking and insurance systems that can be developed this community asset banking is that suppose i have a piece of land at the yes two minutes two minutes it is that i i have a piece of land at the margin of the sea or a river river bank and definitely the river is coming to my land and it will be washed away so in the in the nature uh, nothing is uh, like that uh, going to be washed away so somewhere my plot is going to be deposited so that is my land but it is not that i am going to get that land and that land may not be usable this year so if there is a community asset banking system then some lands can be given to them or some lands can be as a bank land can be uh, taken as the community land which can be given uh, to the particular person whose land has already been uh, destroyed and uh, in this way we have to have the focus on capacity building and the resilience at the community level otherwise the doll politics and the market economy that will not definitely do much good to the people at the grassroots level so with the disasters learning from the disaster experiences we must uh, be careful about uh, this particular aspect and uh, that's all about it thank you thank you very much yes it's over to somasis thank you sir for your nice um, deliberation and presentations we are actually enriched by how the um, local governments the ngos can help a lot in disaster preparedness and management so i'd like to request the participants if you have any question you can please put forward i think sir will be happy to answer them so although i do not find it in any in, in ch chat box so i think sir uh, even, they, even they can ask in bengali also okay so karo jodi banglay prashno thake obosshoi korte paren so i think uh, no i do not find anything in the chat box sir yes perhaps uh, they they have not accepted it <laughs> no, no no sir it's not like that sir uh, probably they, uh, it's so clear in fact it's so clear to us that uh, we could understand the entire thing so yes. okay, okay sir then so if uh, there is no question then uh, we can wind up sure Raji. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. We, we can wind up, sir. Uh, I, I think you uh, you can thank everyone, our speakers. Otherwise, I can do that. So for today, we had three sessions. And first was on Flood and Cyclone Resistant Infrastructure Methods and Techniques by Professor Chandan Ghosh. And second was on Forecasting Cyclones and Disaster Management by Dr. Sanjeev Bandopadhyay. And last one was on the role of local governance and NGOs and disaster preparedness and management by Pro Professor Lakshmina and Satyati. So we have uh, seen different aspects of flood, cyclone, and hazards, and how uh, government uh, 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 legislation and local governance can work. Uh, in the first session, we we, we have seen uh, that uh, Professor Ghosh has described the flood uh, 
flood after taking various measures intensity is increasing day by day and what are the natural ways of flood protection and water storing vulnerability metrics etc and then in the second session uh, dr sanjeev badnyopadhyay discussed about the monsoon and the other major weather events global observation systems genesis and intensification of cyclones bulletins uh, and warning issued global disaster losses etc in the last session uh, sir discussed about the world population distribution how ge geographically or geoclimatically uh, climatically disasters are uh, distributed what are the legislative and constitutional roles in disaster situations local governance community empowerment and disaster mitigation and re reduction and goals and visions for the future resilient community so this was uh, for today's uh, uh, training program and i hope uh, uh, for tomorrow the participants uh, will again join and we will have a fruitful sessions also so for nidm side i would like to thank our, our speakers for today's session thank you very much sir and uh, uh, i think we can conclude now sir thank you uh, from we, you we will uh, join tomorrow at 2:30 also i am also NIDM, yeah. all the uh, dignitaries who have delivered their lectures the I mean, three lectures were excellent yes uh, from infrastructure to local government yes sir and in between cyclone prediction was there engaging <laughs> communities must sir because they are the first responders <laughs> yeah okay, okay. sensitizing uh, them is must yeah. all the best shobai bhalo thakben okay thank, thank you i am leaving yeah yeah, yeah. thank you very much sir thank, thank you very you. much yeah. okay okay thank you, you sana sir uh, thoda bahut bangla samajhte ho मुझे नहीं आती सर मुझे हल्की फुल्की मे बी आई कैन अंडरस्टैंड बट आई हैव नेवर स्पोकन सो आई डोंट नो आई कैन ओके लेट सी यू टुमारो ओके सर फाइन सर यू कैन एंड द यू आर नाउ होस्ट सो कट द कॉल एंड द इवेंट विल बी क्लोज्ड टुमारो टुमारो नहीं सर अभी अभी आप बंद कर दीजिए ये बंद करता हूं हां तो बंद हो जाएगा ये एंड मीटिंग फॉर ऑल हाँ यस सर